Our next speaker is Robert Bailey. He's a Regional Outreach Officer with the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. Yes, and thank you, Andrew, for the opportunity to come down and speak to everybody here. Right. This, the uh, presentation I have does get rather technical, so I'm going to really try and skim through it quickly. It is a, on, a, on a copy of uh, a, a little thumb drive, so I would encourage anybody who's thinking about sponsoring uh, a, a skilled migrant, or indeed if you're uh, hiring people and they tell you they're a permanent resident or a temporary resident, we can deal with those sorts of issues. But take, this, take the uh, thumb drive because it's like skilled migration in a nutshell as of this point in time. I don't have handouts because our, our legislation changes. We're, it changes constantly. So there's no point in us going to print. Everything is on our website and I'll give you that address later. But to put it into context, this is the, the growth of skilled against family in our migration programs. And you can see now that uh, in the last few years, it's two thirds of the total program consists of skilled migration. Skilled migration is very good for the country. But back then, in the early days when family were the uh, predominant percentage of the, uh, um, the programs, Australia didn't really have much control over what kind of skills were coming into the country. Permanent residents, people who are permanent residents have all of these rights, you can hire them, no problems whatsoever. They have uh, access to Medicare and all, sort, all sorts of social security elements there. These are people who are not citizens, they're permanent residents of Australia. Temporary residents, it's another story. There are, you can employ them, but look at their, their, their visa conditions because if you're employing a student, they can only work 20, uh, sorry, 40 hours a fortnight. Uh, they can't work any more than that. There are periods of time when they can work 100 hours a week if they wish to, which are during semester breaks and at the end of their course. Um, they also do, in many instances, uh, 457 visas, you've probably heard about those. Their family members can actually work unencumbered they are not bound by the same strictures that a, the, the primary applicant is. Working holidays, working holiday makers, there are lots of them around. Uh, usually on the 417 visa at the moment, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, Irish um, young people between the ages of 19 and 30 flooding into Australia and looking to stay. You can employ them for up to six months. If they're on the 417 visa, there is a, a, a nice little loophole that allows them to actually get to stay in Australia for another, another 12 months. If they work in a region of Australia, and you're in a region, if they work in agriculture, mining or construction, and agriculture also in, includes aqua, aquaculture and fishing, uh, they, that entitles them to get another 12 months. They can only work for an employer for six months. If they get their second 12 months, they can come back and work for you for a second six months. Okay. And I have to mention this, there are pretty severe penalties for employing people who are, um, whose visa conditions do not allow them to work. And uh, I won't go into it too deeply, but there, there are serious fines and in some instances prison sentences for doing so. What I wanted to get onto now is uh, through our constantly evolving legislation, we've, we've come up with some fairly serious changes to the migration, the skilled migration program. 457, not so much in that area, but certainly in the, uh, in the permanent areas. The 457 you're probably already aware of, it's a visa that uh, you can employ a skilled person it's list-based, so if the occupation isn't on the list, you can't employ them. Uh, you can employ them from one day up to four years. And they can bring their family too. And like I said earlier, their family members could also work for you, but unencumbered. If you as a sponsor of a 457 uh, visa holder bring somebody in, that person, that primary applicant, can, cannot work for anybody else without having found sponsorship by another employer. So they're, they're, they're strictly working for you. They can't even moonlight. Labor agreements are a, a, um, 
a bespoke uh, program that we have for companies that are, can't find the occupations that they require on the 457 list. We only go so far in terms of skill levels. If, you're, if anybody here is uh, familiar with the ANSCO, the Australian New Zealand Standard Classification of Occupations, that becomes our bible. It becomes a determining factor in whether or not we'll allow somebody in. And certainly, if there are occupations that are at a, a reasonably high skill level but not nominated on the 457 lists, you could go into an agreement with our department and seek concessions. One of those concessions might be the occupation, another one could be the English uh, eligibility level of the applicants. You could look for a concession there. The, the other two, well, sorry, there are three more there, but Regional Sponsored Migration and Employer Nomination Scheme, uh, we've had uh, some fairly significant changes in those areas. I will come back to those. The bottom category there, skilled uh, independent, that's under our general skilled migration program. It's where a, an overseas professional or an international student who's just finished their, this successfully finished their studies is able to sponsor themselves in either independently or with the assistance of a state government. It's a points-based program and there have been some significant changes to that as well. The 457, the list that these people uh, are on is on our website. It's called CSOL, the Consolidated Skilled Occupation List. We've um, used to have a separate list. We've combined them now because the articulation from temporary 457 through to uh, permanent residence, if an employer wanted to take some of his employers uh, across into permanent residence, not every occupation uh, was able to be carried forward. So there was a disconnect. We've, we've connected those two programs. Right, so within the permanent programs, we used to have six visas. There were onshore and offshore differentiations. We've now got two. There is no offshore or um, onshore differentiation in the, uh, in, in the programs. There's a streamlining from 457 uh, to either um, through permanent residence, through the employer nominated and the regional sponsored programs. Regional sponsored is available for everywhere in Western Australia now as of September of last year. It used to only, uh, Perth, Perth metropolitan area was not able to access the RSMS program. We've raised the upper limit from 45 to just under 50. So if anyone's 50, we've got a problem, 49, years and 363 days is fine at the point of lodgement of their application. Uh, we've raised the English skill levels. Uh, they used to be quite easy for people to come in under the RSMS program. It was a 4.5 average on IELTS. I'm not sure if anybody know what IELTS is. Good, International English Language Testing System. Okay, so now even in the RSMS program, there are, is a requirement for people to get six in each of the streams. And we've made it, uh, I've mentioned the, uh, the, the, the list, and we've refocused the, the regional certifying uh, network. Under the regional program, you've got to go to a regional certifying body to gain uh, recommendation from them before you can actually lodge the visa application. Within the two, um, different visa subclasses, we now have three streams. There's a direct entry stream, this is for people who are offshore, who have no experience in the uh, Australian job market. You can sponsor them in, fairly steep criteria. The temporary residence transition stream is for uh, allowing people who have been working on a 457 visa for the previous two years to be sponsored by their employer in the same job, in the same role. Uh, having worked for those two years, they don't have to go through skills assessments and they don't have to meet the English at the higher level because the English testing for 457 is at five and we expedite the processing of those particular uh, applications. There's also the agreement stream and I spoke of that a little earlier, the labour agreement side, which uh, has also been condensed into these two visa subclasses rather than having a separate onshore and offshore uh, categories for themselves. Take one of those 
um, units, uh, one of those thumb drives, because it, uh, it actually gets into the, some of these details about what you can and can't look at um, and, and the eligibility issues. But uh, I, it says here also that the um, visa applicants, both in these temporary, uh, in, this, in this transition scheme, uh, that must be less than 50 unless exempt, and there's also vocational English unless exempt. The vocational English is if this person's going to be paid $180,000 per annum, so they don't have to do an English test. The uh, age issue is if they're over 50, they have to meet the Fair Work Australia high income threshold for the previous four years. At the moment, that sits at $118,000, and it's uh, every year it, it creeps up incrementally. Likewise for the direct entry stream, except uh, the, uh, the, the three years relevant work experience under the employer nomination scheme can't be waived. So somebody has to have had three years experience in that role uh, here and overseas. It, 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 it's, that's not uh, uh, an issue, but uh, we've, we now absolutely insist on that. And uh, the skills assessments also must be done for people being sponsored in under that particular program. Under the regional sponsored migration side, uh, there's no work experience requirement or skills assessed because they've already gone through the two years working on the 457. Uh, and I'll just I'll move on. I know I'm running out of time here. So they, there were exemption categories they used to be subjective. Um, we've now gone to um, objective ob exemptions in this age and English areas. So people from the countries listed there, they, um, they, it's not absolutely necessary for them to sit English tests. pass on the labour agreements. I'll get into this. Skill Select is a new program that the people uh, try to sponsor themselves in. Uh, they, they have to access this first. We used to have a program whereby if somebody had successfully completed their studies, they could lodge a visa application and sit in Australia for years on a bridging visa A and until we made up our mind as to whether or not we were going to grant or refuse that visa application. No more. What we do now is people put in an expression of interest. They must meet a points test. We look at the highest percentile scorers and invite those in each of the visa, in each of the occupational categories that, that Australia needs at the time, to actually lodge a visa application. So a lot of these people who uh, previously came in and sat around for those years, it, it's basically knocked that on the head for them we determine who comes in and we can actually manage our workloads through, through this particular process. But there's another element to it as well. People who wish to migrate to Australia can actually go into this skill select and tick a box and say, yes, I want my CV in there. So if you're looking for specialised skills, you may be, as an employer, you can access many of the people who have agreed to allow you to look at their details and in which case you can make direct contact with them if you feel that they are a likely candidate for a job that you that you have. Of course the government likes people to come here and have a job already but there is always that need to uh, have a pool of people who are skilled in particular occupations and who move in and out of these uh, these jobs hence the uh, general skilled program. More information there. Those links will help you if you take one of the, uh, one of the little thumb drives. And if you wish to contact me, there's my number. If you wish to make a phone, if you wish to phone me, come and see me and I'll give you a business card. And thank you.